you know, I, I think that those of us in the, in the U.S. market could really uh, afford to be educated a lot on what goes on outside of our borders, uh, you know, in the international and in the European market. And I was hoping we could start today by just having you give us an overview of the current state of the, the European and the, the data center market in Ireland um, and, and how you describe it today for, for someone that may not be familiar with it. Okay. Um, fundamentally, uh, I'll start with Ireland and then I'll expand out to the, the greater European area. But um, Ireland is in itself, we, we have an association with North American companies now going back 60 years. Um, you know, there's 11.6% of the US uh, population tick a box and they say that they're Irish. So it's easy to find a guy in a company that's prepared to say he's at least partially Irish. And as you all know, as part of sales, uh, that first connection is so important. So right. we, we Irish, we leverage that a lot. And as a result of that, going back to IBM in 1956, uh, we've had all of the waves of change. That's the key thing from the mainframe to the mini computer, to local area networks, to now the cloud. And um, we've always been in that space. So to me, maybe, maybe I'm not as uh, technical as some of the other listeners, but uh, you know, the cloud is just the latest manifestation of how we store forward and also secure data. Um, and Ireland has always been able to play in that space. So now we find ourselves in a situation where uh, we 400 megawatts of data center space in Dublin alone, another 190 megawatts under development, and wow. 400 additional megawatts in the queue. Um, and and it's, it's a blend. That's what we like is that it's the co-location managed services and the hyperscales. And I think as a lot of your delegates and, and, and listeners would know, um, no data set sits alone anymore. A bit on private, a bit on hybrid, a bit on public. Some sits in AWS, some sits in, 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 in Azure. So ultimately, uh, their proximity to each other helps a lot when when uh, uh, people are choosing where to host their data. So, you know, you you got to have, and, and, and this is no different whether it's in Arizona or whether it's in Loudoun County, you've got to have the fundamentals, right? You've got to have the, what I call the concrete, in, in, and that's the, the power in the pipes. If you don't have the power in the pipes, then what discussion are we having? Um, so given that you have the power in the pipes, Europe, interesting, uh, uh, is we're more, we're more aware, I'd say, than North America on renewable energy. Green energy um, is, is nearly a prerequisite in Europe um, because, and I'm, I'm, I think it's because the Nordics in particular, uh, which will be sort of Scandinavian countries, Sweden, they have a surplus of renewable energy. Right. Therefore, good for the industry it's made meant that all of the rest of us have to really have a concentration on providing renewable green energy to the data center industry and and, and that sort of would be more more on our agenda a higher level of our agenda than possibly some of the north american geographic locations so that's ireland europe um you know from a from a how to design, build, and operate a data center now. I mean, I think that's a global set of metrics that people have worked out. And particularly when you bear in mind the biggest co-location managed services companies in Europe are actually American. Equinix, Digital Realty um, um, uh, in particular. So, you know, they, they have standards and they drop in the standards and they will be the, the, the largest of the co-location managed services companies. And you'd also have local providers, obviously, indigenous sure. companies that provide specialist services. You also then have the, the hyperscales. The hyperscales are the same in North America as they are in Europe. It's Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, and probably Amazon. Right. So when you bear that in mind, it's an interesting world we live in, in that geographically now, a lot of the same brands are all over the Euro, Euro, Europe and APAC area. What does differentiate maybe slightly is, and it'd be interesting and it's easy for your uh, listeners to remember, flap de, as in <laughs> London, Amsterdam, Paris, and Dublin are the four largest metropolitan clusters in Europe. Um, and they would have been four of them 
Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam and Paris would have been built around the fact they are the largest financial bourses in Europe. Right. So they're the ones that obviously would have the low latency requirements, the high frequency trading requirements. Again, in North America, you know, they don't care about the power prices. They don't care about telecoms prices. They just care about picoseconds. And that right. acted as that catalyst. Dublin, on the other hand, was always this other um, because we were more interested in the data and then obviously the centers that are needed to host the data now and going back to our legacy, we were always the digital gateway to Europe, whether it was IBM, Informix, right the way through. So they're the physical sort of uh, what we would call uh, uh, tier one locations. We then have the next wave, which is growing very rapidly, and they are the Nordics doing really well. They have an excess and a surplus of renewable energy. So therefore, they're, they're um, ideal for the likes of uh, high performance compute because they're a little bit more further north. So they don't have the proximity to the eyeballs and they probably don't have the proximity to the things either. And obviously that's very important, but they certainly have a hundred percent renewable and a lot of available energy. So therefore high performance compute rendering and maybe some of the archive data that isn't required on a picosecond or a nanosecond basis. So Europe is, is effectively five main cities where you have the clustering of the co-location and the managed services. You then have different proximity zones and it's something we discussed before. The, the way that I think the world is going, not just Europe, is you've got one set of requirements which is proximity to the eyeballs and the things. That's every street corner, every building, every single metropolitan location. I guess the, 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 to me, the, probably the latest buzzword is the edge. Is that the edge? Um, maybe. I thought the edge was my Fitbit. But anyway, <laughs> ultimately, you know, you must be at the proximity zone to those eyeballs, to the manufacturing 4.0, to the autonomous cities, the smart buildings, which you're very much aware of. That's proximity to the things. Dublin, on the other hand, is prox where you have all the major data sets proximity to each other. So sure. you have Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and all of the co-location guys. You know, because a lot of the back-end big data, uh, AI stuff, a lot of the data science stuff, they basically are all just interoperating between each other and then trucking out a result. And then the third type of proximity, we feel, is proximity to renewable and available large amounts of renewable energy and uh, I'm not sure if it resonates as hard in North America but the green piece dirty cloud yep that's something that's very regularly discussed in Europe um, and therefore um, you know this is not possible in every geographic area to have a hundred percent renewable but they they blend it between a and B sure uh, ultimately now the desire is from what I can see there's a genuine desire um, to be a hundred percent renewable in most of the uh, hyperscales co-location and managed services companies and uh, uh, obviously that's driven by a number of fundamentals but I just think that they, they the, the, the investors they want to be able to say that they're investing in a cleaner environment than maybe the dirtier ones um, so obviously that's what's driving a lot of the decisions in Europe.